I just couldn't accept the idea of my family being under the Nazis. And so I had to find some way of making a contribution to the war. In the early years of the war, Hugh Verity was a night fighter pilot. But in 1942, he volunteered for RAF special duties and so became involved in one of the most extraordinary and effective operations of the secret war. Flying from the Sussex coast in an unarmed single-engined Lysander aircraft and landing in remote corners of German-occupied France to deliver and collect agents of the French resistance in absolute secrecy by the light of the moon. Throughout 1943, Hugh Verity led a flight of 161 Special Duties Squadron. He was 24. Commander of B Flight was Bob Hodges. Both flights were based near Bedford at RAF Tempsford. The trouble with Tempsford was it was a bit far north for operations in France. So 161 Squadron pickup flight, A flight, used to come down here to Tangmere every moon period. By that I mean one week before and one week after full moon. Because with the aid of the moon, it was, it was much easier to uh, find your way over France. Today, RAF Tangmere is a memory and a museum, the famous control tower, a ruin. But nearby, there's Tangmere Cottage, the nerve center of the secret missions. This was the operations room first and last port of call for so many courageous men and women. The present owner has preserved the spirit of the room and it's little changed. Hugh Verity's Lysander in 1943. There's a reconstruction of it at Duxford near Cambridge. The Lysander was robust, powered by a single Mercury engine it could land and take off within 150 yards. Each had its own code letter. Hugh's was J. And so I called it Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket seemed to be a suitable character from the Walt Disney films of my youth. After all, he's, he's pretty good at jumping around the place. And <laughs> There's one um, or two important omissions on this <coughs> reconstruction. One is the lack of the ladder. There was always a fixed ladder on the port side of the fuselage. The other thing is that we had a an extra fuel tank between the wheels here, shaped like a torpedo. One of my pilots, uh, who had been a Spitfire pilot, said that Lysanders after Spitfires were like trying to fly a London bus. Well, I think that was quite unnecessarily rude. I, I enjoyed flying a Lysander. It required a cool head and a young one. Jimmy McCanns, who'd flown with Douglas Bader. Peter Vaughan Fowler, aged 20. Bunny Rymills just 22. Then the moon came out. Without the moon, we would have been lost, I think. Yeah. You did do a trip, one trip, though, I believe, in the dark, didn't you? Uh, I, when I did a landing before moonrise once. That's right. Just yes. to see how frightening it was. Yes. And it frightened me so much, I never tried yes, it again. That's right, yes, I remember. That. As commander of B-Flight, Bob Hodges had specialized in parachuting secret agents into occupied Europe. He was made commander of the special squadron, so he trained himself to fly Lysanders and twin-engined Hudsons by night and was soon lending a hand. Navigation uh, in the Lysanders was particularly difficult. One had to fly uh, visually with maps on your knee. Uh, the maps would fall on the floor. There'd be quite a job picking them up again with a torch and so on. It was all quite tricky. But one got uh, used to it. Uh, flying over the same stretches of country in the north of France between the Normandy coast and the Loire, down the Loire Valley. One got to know the country fairly well. Well, this is where I used to cross yes. the Loire, just near yes. the Loire. I think uh, when uh, God made the earth, he uh, designed in France with the Loire so we, uh, for the Lysander pilots, because yeah. without that, we would have been lost. Wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> and the Cabourg yes. Inlet, of course. That well, was that, that was the best that part, was really, the wasn't it? Part, this, yes. This, uh, yes. In that there. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Yes. Once you saw the inlet, you're right. The first leg of the trip on, uh, was underway. The clandestine activities of A Flight were known to very few people, least of all to the villagers of Tangmere, Sussex, where secrecy was essential. We were just opposite the main gate of Tangmere Airfield, RAF Tangmere, but uh, the entrance 
to our car park was shielded by high fencing so that once the Secret Service station wagons swept in through the gate, they were invisible from the road and uh, they could unload their passengers, our passengers to be, without anybody seeing them. Every moon period, secret intelligence agents were driven down from London to a safe house on the downs near Petworth. Major Anthony Bertram had offered his home for that purpose. His task was to ensure the security of the operation, and inevitably his wife Barbara was drawn into the secret web. We lived entirely by the moon. Next moon and last moon, not next month and last month at all. They were all agents working with the intelligence section of the resistance movement. They would come down to me at about three. One of the things I had to do uh, was to go through the, their luggage, looking at everything they'd bought since they'd been in England, see if it was marked made in England. If so, remove it. Shirts and pyjamas were easy. You rubbed very, very hard with Milton. Either it rubbed it out or it rubbed a hole in the shirt. Now, that was all right. And if they bought a new suit, the buckle on the back of a man's waistcoat had to be cut off and the straps sewn together. And then I had to do a horrible thing. Some of them th thought that they couldn't withstand torture. They would be sure to talk and that would mean giving away their friends. And they used to get me to sew a piece of poison into their cuff. And I'm glad to say I don't know if any of them ever used it. It was a horrible feeling. In the family living room behind the dartboard, Major Bertram built a secret cupboard. In which we kept the poison, the revolvers they were all given, and the Coshes and the, all sorts of things of that sort they were given. Missions were dependent entirely on the weather. And sometimes while we were having supper, a tang mare would ring up and say, it's, it's off, it's going to rain, it's going to be foggy. Then we should have to have a terribly jolly evening. And sometimes the pilots themselves would come over, which made quite a big crowd in our smallish house. They would ask us to come and have a little party with uh, house guests to cheer them up a bit because, you know, they get a bit fidgety. They were waiting for their operation and they were terribly keyed up. And it was good for them to have a chance to chat to some people and there's no security objection. We'd always end with a sing song and we'd sing Alouette and Sur le Pont d'Avignon and Au Clair de la Lune, uh, and all the sort of well-known songs of that sort. It was always a very jolly evening. We used to enjoy it very much, having the pilots over. To while away the time, the agents might play darts in the pub in nearby Sutton, but they were never told the name of the village. Because towards the end, one of the questions that the Gestapo asked them was, did you pass through Major Bertram's house? And if they said yes, the first next question was, where is it? And they didn't know. When at last the skies cleared or fog lifted, the message came from Tangmere, it's on. And then it was necessary to let the people in the networks in France know which field we were coming to. And that was done by prearranged coded messages transmitted after the French news by the BBC. Ici Londres. Voici notre huitième bulletin d'information. Écoutez tout d'abord quelques messages personnels. The BBC used to send out uh, les messages personnels, and we used that for letting the resistance workers know when an operation was going to be on. And one of the code names for an operation was Caroline, the name of our goat. So the, that particular night, the, the, the word that would mean that it was on that night was blue. So a lot of messages went out night after night. Caroline has gone for a walk today, and Caroline has done this, and Caroline has done that. Then suddenly, Caroline has bought a new blue dress. That meant it was on that night. Message très important. 
The agent responsible for the operation on the ground would have heard this message and he would get together his team, what we call a reception committee. They would have got a field which was at least 500 yards long and um, into wind, at least 100 metres from the boundary of the field, would be the first pocket torch or bicycle lamp or whatever they could get hold of. Uh, possibly on a stick about uh, three feet high, to keep it out clear of the long grass. And um, 150 metres into wind would be the second lamp, and 50 metres to the right of that would be the third lamp. Now, by the first lamp, the agent would wait for the sound of a Lysander engine and then flash a prearranged Morse letter and the pilot would reply with his downward white light from below the cockpit uh, with another prearranged letter so that the agent would know that it was OK, at which point the other lights would be lit up and so there would be a triangle, a little L-shaped uh, triangle of lights. The aim of the Lysander pilots was to land, exchange their secret passengers and equipment and take off all within the space of three minutes. If it wasn't a muddy, sticky field, the Lysander would be airborne in about 100 yards. The dedication, skill and sheer daring of the pickup pilots is matched only by their modesty. Really, you can't compare the risks with the risks run by the bomber aircraft going over Germany, whose losses were horrific. We were all so young. In fact, our oldest crew member was our Canadian rear gunner, who was 23, and we called him Grandpop. But we, the rest of the crew were, the youngest was the mid-upper gunner, who was 19, and the rest of us were 20. Fred Gardner had left school at 14 and been a cabinet maker before joining Bomber Command. He was the sergeant wireless operator in a Lancaster taking part in a night raid on Germany in 1943 when they were attacked by a Messerschmitt fighter. Fred managed to bail out of the blazing aircraft and landed in darkness in this field in occupied Belgium, narrowly missing the power lines. At daybreak, he spotted a village nearby and set off in search of help. Then he heard a lorry approaching. And I thought, it can only be Germans who've got motor vehicles here. So I was opposite a cottage door, so I opened the door and jumped in quickly and closed the door behind me. And uh, there was a window alongside the door, I looked out, and a German army truck went past full of soldiers. I'm sure that they were part of some sort of search party for any surviving crew members. And uh, I turned to see where I was in, the, in this room. There was an elderly lady and she burst into tears. I don't know whether she was sorry for me because I was a bit uh, roughed up or whether she was scared, probably the latter. He'd landed among friends. Quickly provided with civilian clothes, he was passed on to a sympathetic local priest who gave him a further disguise. He provided me with a cassock, so I was well camouflaged, and some a rendezvous had been arranged uh, for me to meet a resistance man in the woods. So we met the resistance man, and there was some danger because we were out in the curfew, and as civilians we could have been picked up for no reason at all other than being out. Um, this chap was armed, and he gave me a pistol and showed me how to release the safety catch, and we set off. The resistance fighter, codenamed Raymond, was wanted by the Gestapo. German troops were everywhere. They had to pass close to some barracks. And at that moment, a door opened, and the light streamed out, and some German soldiers came out with their rifles slung across their shoulders, um, and two of them made toward bicycles, which were leaning against uh, the hut, mounted the bicycles and started coming, pedalling slowly towards us. But by this time, we were both in the ditch at the side of the road and uh, crouched down, uh, waiting there for them to pass, which they did very close to us. And what bothered me particularly was uh, my companion pulls out his pistol, points it at the Germans and kept it trained on the Germans as they passed about three yards away. And uh, I was having palpitations there. 
if we'd coughed or sneezed, I think there'd have been some bullets flying. At his next secret rendezvous, Fred was equipped with forged papers, but then he was led to a private room in a small hotel. The doors were locked, and one of the men in the room was Flight Sergeant Herbert Pond, a pilot in the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Pond was in rather a, rather a difficult spot. The resistance men thought he was a German plant, and uh, he was in, in danger of, uh, of them uh, executing him, in fact. So the resistance men asked me if I could uh, vouch for him. So I asked Pond a few questions, and it transpired that he and I had been on a training station some months before. We hadn't known each other at the time, and we'd witnessed a, a quite bizarre incident where some Australian crews had acquired some chickens, and they'd flown them from upstairs windows to see how far they could fly across the parade ground. And I think there were bets placed on it too. Well, no German could have known those details, so I was able to clear Pond, and uh, afterwards he, he said, I, I'm sure you saved my life. Gardner and Pond were now on the famous Possum escape route from Belgium down into France. For weeks they travelled together, in constant danger and with only a few words of French between them. Misreading a notice, Fred shoved his way onto a train and into the wrong carriage. And I was followed by lots of German officers in their very resplendent uniforms, and one or two actually said, excuse me, in French, as they pushed past me in the corridor. And I thought, yes, you don't know I'm wearing an RAF PT vest. <laughs> we had to bear in mind the possibility of some form of prang on landing on fields which were unfortunately going across ditches. And for those occasions, one wanted to be able to merge into the general scenery and not look too much like an RAF pilot. So um, some of us wore civilian clothes underneath with a little bit of uniform on top, just in case we were caught by the Germans before we were trying to do a run. Uh, in the flight line book, which I treasure, there's a, a remark by Wing Commander Hodges saying, but of course I'd always want to wear my tunic, otherwise walking into a prison camp they wouldn't know what my rank was. In the moon period of September 1943, which I called a harvest moon, we had nights fit for pickup operations, 12 nights running from the 10th to the 21st of September. Actually, it's an exceptionally good moon period. We attempted 25 landings and achieved 19. We were six pilots in the flight at that time and the squadron commander, Wing Commander Hodges, also did uh, two pickup operations with us, one with the Hudson and one with the Lysander. Hugh Verity was an experienced pilot with a night flying experience which was particularly valuable and uh, um, he had the ability to weld the flight into a very closely knit and efficient organisation uh, and uh, led extremely well from the front and uh, carried out a lot of operations himself. After five weeks on the run, Fred Gardner had reached this house near Reims. From the last house where we were hidden, we were told that there would be a chance for Flight Sergeant Pond and myself to be flown home. Uh, we were quite amazed at this and I thought we would be very lucky if that came off. I did a single pickup north of northwest of Reims, or Reims if you talk English. And uh, this was for the Possum um, MI9 network, which was a Belgian escape and evasion network. Three or four resistance men arrived, together with a Belgian agent, and uh, we set off into, uh, into the darkness, although there was quite a moon. It was quite a moonlight night. I remember it as being rather dodgy because for two reasons. One was that there was no welcome for me when I arrived over the field and I had to circle the area for an hour waiting for a light to come up. And uh, the other was that there was a haystack very close indeed to the strip of ground I had to land on. I don't know whether the aircraft was early or we were late, but the Lysander came overhead uh, rather some time before we got to the landing strip. And he circled round, flashing his identification lights. 
and I thought this is uh, this, this is impossible. Um, so we had to run the last half mile to get to the field, and then we found that some of it had been ploughed. That caused some consternation amongst the resistance men, but there was a small part left with grass. The the area of good solid ground on on which one landed and rolled was. Uh, much too narrow. But we quickly set out three torches uh, as a flare path and it was my job as a, a wireless operator to do the signalling. So I flashed the letter R, I remember distinctly, it was a letter R to the pilot as he did a circuit and he came in and over the haystack and uh, despite a rather big bounce, he made a good landing. We were all crowded into the little cockpit and uh, again, it was my job to give a signal over a, a microphone in the back to the pilot that we were clear to take off. The hatch was closed, and within, well, seconds, really, we were in the air again and uh, into a moonlit sky and had quite a reasonable flight home. And we weren't molested by the enemy until we got to the French coast. There were a few searchlights that uh, wavered about but we weren't picked up and we came across the channel. Again, we could see everything quite well. And uh, I remember looking down on Brighton and uh, my grandmother lived at Port Slade and I could almost pick her house out as we flew over. And of course she didn't know that I was safe. And we came into a beautifully smooth landing at Tangmere. And then of course we were taken into the cottage and introduced to our pilot, Squadron Leader Verity. And uh, I, I had to compliment him on his navigation. I couldn't understand how he could find a field in the middle of France when, as bomber crews, we had, well, I don't like to say it, but quite some difficulty in finding the target sometimes. It was certainly a, a very strange adventure. I couldn't really believe it was happening to me. It seemed like something out of a boy's magazine. <laughs> The reality is that the man who had organised Fred's final escape was dead within months. Commandant Potier did a, a number of operations getting our evading air crew onto our flights back to England. But um, he <clears throat> was eventually uh, betrayed and captured and uh, ruthlessly tortured to get information out of him. And when it got to a point that he had one eye gouged out by his interrogators, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he jumped out of a window to kill himself. There seems little doubt that the sacrifices made by the resistance and their helpers shortened the war by six months or more. After the war, my wife and I made several trips to Belgium to visit these very heroic people again. And on one occasion, we were interviewed by the press and as a result, we had several phone calls, including one from a gendarme who, as a boy, had found my forage cap in the field near the crash, and he asked me if I'd like it back. So we went along to the police station, and uh, there was a ceremony when he presented me with my cap. And uh, I think that concludes the story. Not quite the end. Here he comes. As pilot meets passenger, 50 years on. Oh. Captain Verity. Yes, Fred. Lovely to see you again. Glad to see you, my goodness. Great. After come on 50, into the water. 52 years. Yes, <laughs> come on into the water. Thank wall. you. I couldn't do anything. I spoke languages. And, of course, I could sing. Very useful, I don't think, for a war aim. Uh, you know, when you're young, you, you feel heroic. Uh, and I, I just wanted to be involved. How? I had no idea. What a pretty boy. From 1941 to 1944, Diana de Rosso moved in a shadowy world of secret agents and secret information as a private courier for two of the most powerful spy masters of the Second World War. Today, Diana lives with her younger brother, Tony. For almost 20 years, they together ran the local restaurant in the village of East Dean on the Downs near Eastbourne. I'd like to get the results.
Well, now they are retired. Not now, because I'm busy. Oh, thank you. Diana was born in England and held a British passport, but she was brought up in the south of France, within a few miles of the Italian border, as good a place as any to observe the rise of fascism in the 1930s. Her mother, Hélène, was Welsh, and her father, Louis de Rosso, an anti-fascist Italian aristocrat. Here in France, still in her early teens, Diana began her lifelong affair with the politics of Europe. And I used to listen on uh, French radio to Goebbels, and he was... Um, my German has always been rotten, but I could understand the excitement that was being built up. And therefore, in a sense, for a young girl, I was politically conscious. Uh, far more so than most people who were my school friends weren't interested. She had also inherited a quite remarkable voice, a natural soprano. And soon she was receiving lessons from her great aunt, Marie Louise Edvina, star of the Paris Opera. Then war was declared. I just celebrated my 18th birthday, and I thought, oh God, you know, my friends will be killed, we'll all be killed, and I was very dramatic. And I, from there, I decided I was going to do something, but what? Diana and her mother came to London, and Diana found a job in civil defence. But by 1941, she was part of the cosmopolitan swirl of artists and musicians who had escaped from Europe, and her extraordinary vocal talent marked her out. So I went to an audition, I was taken, I was offered the lead. If I knew them, of course I knew them. Liar, I didn't know anything. But I said, yes, yes, of course I could, yes, I sing in Italian only. I don't know it in English, and I didn't know it in either. But still, I got the contract and I went to Dublin. I was to sing Lucia de la Mamour, which hadn't been done since the days of Tetrazzini and Gilda in Rigoletto, and if successful, Juliette in Romeo and Juliet. And of course, this was you know, beyond my wildest dream. Everything went the way I, I had prayed for. And at the end of it, of course, I had an invitation to return. London was bursting at the seams, not just with émigré artists, but with military attaches and secret intelligence officers of all nationalities, all on the lookout for the perfect recruit. They felt that I could be perhaps useful in other ways, and I was taken to see Colonel Moravets, who I subsequently learned was the chief of the Czech intelligence. Oh, he was a very charming, nice man. He chatted to me a bit, but obviously I was not what he was interested in. General de Gaulle had set up his Free French headquarters in Carlton House Terrace, and it was here that he installed a young French officer as head of French secret intelligence, Colonel Passy. I met Colonel Passy, of whom I knew nothing, uh, through a friend of mine who was a commander in the French Navy. Subsequently, Passy introduced me to Colonel Claude Dancy. Dancy was deputy head of British intelligence, a true English gentleman and ruthless. I think I'm right in saying we actually met at the Waldorf. I think it was the first time we met and we had tea. And um, he asked me a few questions about Dublin and was I interested in going further afield and to, to look for work? And yes, I was. And he said, well, I think we can, you know, help you. And from that, the seeds were sown of how could they help me? Well, we could help you travel. You could go wherever you want. You could go to Switzerland or Spain, or you could get auditions. Oh, you know, my ears stood up, my eyes glistened, and I was hooked. They lifted a curtain and said, look, we can help you, but you must help us. That was my meeting with Claude Dancy and Colonel Passy, who, of course, I learned quite quickly on, were two of the great spy masters of the Second World War. Although they had their own military intelligence units and, and all the paraphernalia, they also had what we used to refer to as their private collection, a few unknown, unattached bods. 
that they could make use of. I happened to be one of them because I could sing. The secrecy of the private collection was absolute. Nobody knew who the others were. I mean, you would know perhaps who your colleague was because you would meet, but you would, they're creatures. They wanted to be free to organize some pretty dirty tricks, which they did. André de Vavrin, alias Colonel Passy, was a French patriot and a brave one. He called himself Passy after the station on the Paris Metro. We know he visited his agents in occupied France and was brought back to England at least once by the famous Lysander pickup operation out of RAF Tangmere in Sussex. At Bignor, on the Sussex Downs just north of Tangmere, the intelligence services kept a safe house for secret agents. It was run by Major Anthony Bertram and his wife Barbara. The enigmatic Colonel Passy stayed there. Colonel Passy came down to Bignor and was not going over to Tangmere, so was left with me. And my husband didn't really quite like leaving him with alone with me. He never attracted me in the least. There was something cold about him. As I say, I never really took to him. He was very charming, rather cool. Um, you know, the French uh, can be a little bit what I call, uh, they have a, an auteur, a sort of um, reserve. He was very intelligent, very charming always, very courteous. But underlying it, I always felt that he was observing, he was assessing. Passy decided they could make use of Diana as a private courier. Travel would be made possible if I used the camouflage, if you like, of a young singer, young and quite pretty at the time, to go abroad, audition, try and get a broadcast, make contact with conductors, musicians, singers, you know, put forward my career. At the same time, fit in with the necessities and the um, service that I would be asked to do on behalf of my masters. If I was to travel to other countries, I needed another passport, a neutral passport. And of course, I could have had a forged one. The forged papers were top class. Nevertheless, it was Passy who determined in his own very meticulous way that it would be better if I genuinely had foreign papers. Quite by chance, my brother-in-law, James Mason, was filming at the time, and he had said to me that a young stand-in was absolutely desperate to stay in England. I think he found it funny that I was desperate to get out, the man was desperate to stay in. And I said, oh, he might just suit me very nicely. I, what is he? And he said Spanish. And Anyway, he arranged a meeting. We met, we had a chat. Um, he told me why he wanted to stay in England. I told him why I wanted to get out. Um, I said, should we make a deal that uh, we'd get married and divorce as quickly as possible? Uh, we never really thought about that. Anyway, we did it. Uh, we went to Maribyrn Registry Office. We got married and that was it. We shook hands, we had a drink and it was bye-bye. I had what I wanted. He had ostensibly what he wanted. Didn't quite work out that way though. Still, Passy wasn't satisfied. I was given an order to attend Lewis Prison. I was somewhat surprised. I said, why? And they said, well, your husband's there. I duly attended the prison. I was very impressed by its outside, which had lovely greenery hanging around it. Not very impressed with the inside. I asked him if there was anything I could do, what had happened, and he said he'd been arrested on a trumped-up charge of having firearms. And I said, what's going to happen? And he said, I don't know. They're going to send me to prison or intern me or both. And I said, I'm awfully sorry. Well, we'll, we'll see if there's anything I can do. Let me know. And I went away and I reported that I'd been and done what I'd... and asked what had happened. They said, mind your business. It's got nothing to do with you. This is perfect. You're married to a Spaniard. He's been imprisoned and he will be interned. And at the end of the war, we'll kick him out. And you've got nothing more to do with it. Of course, in the process, I made it 
very clear that I was not any heroine in the making. I knew too much about the kind of thing that could occur to people who were apprehended and arrested in enemy territory. In 1943, a young French girl arrived in Paris. And uh, of course it was full of uh, German that we called the Dorifor. I think the Dorifor in English is the Colorado Beetle, but that's what we used to call them. Catherine had come to Paris from Brittany, the heart of the French resistance movement. A few days earlier, Jean Camera had arrived from England to be a senior officer in the resistance. I met Jean Camera at my cousin's flat a few days after he had been landed in occupied France in the most famous uh, Lysander operation. Three Lysander came down with nine men and he was one of those. That evening, over supper, Camera recruited Catherine. And he said, I need somebody to go, go somewhere for me. So I said, well, I go. And then uh, it was, I can't remember exactly what it was for. Maybe it was to deliver a message that the appointment had been changed or something very, very simple like that. And of course, we used to get messages via radio from England. Those messages had to be coded or decoded and then delivered to the people interested. So I learned to code and decode. Then sometime I was asked to carry some arms. I remember one day going into Saint-Sulpice with a with silencieux pistol. And um, other times uh, I went to tell people that they were going to be arrested and that they should move and keep, uh, get away. And uh, that way, one day I was sent to Le Mans and I arrived at the station, I took the bus and I went to that house and I rang the bell. Nobody answered. I didn't dare turn around. I was so frightened that the German would be behind my back and that they would, they would arrest me. I did not know what to do. I said, I closed my eyes and then I turned around, closing my eyes, and I opened my eyes again and there was nobody there. So I rushed back to the main road and I took the bus. My duties were comparatively simple. They didn't ask one to do anything like encoding or decoding or deciphering or using radio or anything. You went, you were a messenger, you were not a diplomatic bag, but you were a post bag. And of course the methods mainly used, nine times out of ten, were through music. Uh, for instance, if I had a score or number of sheet music songs from different kinds which were suitable for auditioning. From there, although all music was sealed in England before I departed, once I was abroad it was perfectly simple. I opened the seal, I took out the music, I took out the piece that I was told to deliver and received in return a song to add to my collection. Encoded within sheet music was the most secret and sensitive information. Allied troop movements, sabotage plans, instructions that would affect the entire conduct of the war. For almost four years, Diana carried her secret songs to and from the capitals of neutral Europe, flying sometimes in small planes from remote airfields in Scotland and the West Country to Madrid, Geneva, Stockholm, Dublin, and Lisbon. In Lisbon especially, agents and double agents mingled easily with diplomats and bankers, and with the young singer just arrived for a concert. Thus, Diana was able to deliver and collect not only coded information for her masters, but all the gossip or rumor which she overheard. Intelligence work of any description is made up mainly of boring, long analysis and assessment. All kinds of little items that you might glean at a cocktail party could, in effect, carry some minute piece of information which just fitted into a puzzle. 
therefore ears were very important. And in my case, wariness. I was born wary. And I think this is perhaps the one characteristic that both my masters noted. Back in London, Diana delivered her freshly coded songs and her news to Colonel Passy and Colonel Dancy, for their eyes and ears only. If we met one-to-one, -one, if you like, then there would be a discussion as to how things had turned out, what I'd observed, what did I feel, you know, was I anxious, had I got anxieties. Um, otherwise, we would perhaps be a little group, a small group, four or five, um, naval men, um, army. Um, at the at Carlton House Terrace, we would sit in uh, circles of six or seven at a table, and sometimes with General de Gaulle, who would appear. Uh, I never sat at his table, but I would sit just alongside him and see the great man. Uh, I, I was always what the French term a solitaire, not solitary in the sense that the, it might be translated, but I was always very self-contained. And the only thing that I had, which I think was probably a great recommendation, I had a pretty phenomenal memory. I never drank, I didn't smoke. I was a virgin until I was over 21, which was a unique, um, because in the war, people were hopping in and out of bed because tomorrow might not come. But I was very much, very reserved, very watchful, very wary. For the young Catherine Gampel, wariness and danger went hand in hand on the streets of Paris. One day I was told uh, to go and collect some money. I was warned that the person who had been before me ne never came back. But uh, I said, all right, I go. So I went. And uh, there was a courier that I did not know uh, who handed me a parcel. As a matter of fact, I never saw that courier anymore. But in any case, I was walking along with my parcel. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my left shoulder, a hand on my right shoulder, and people said, police. So I was a little bit afraid of what was going to happen later on. As a matter of fact, they looked at my parcel, they noticed that it was money, and they said, all right, we'll go to the commissariat of police at Picpus, and you explain what that parcel is and where it comes from and where it's going. And so we walked along quietly, not too fast, and then suddenly I heard, all right, you go, we keep the parcel, and I left. I went to the first tube station and there uh, I stayed in the tube practically the whole day, changing every time I could. I was so frightened that they had put somebody who was following me to know where I was going, where I was coming from, where I was going next. I was so aware of my safety and the dreadful risks that other people who were field people, field agents, that they took. And I don't think there's anyone who had similar work to mine doesn't feel the same and didn't feel the same. A certain relief that we were safe and a sense of guilt that other people were putting their lives on the line. Real name, Marie Madeleine Fourcard. She was, to my mind, exactly like a cinema spy. But you never knew the next time she came what coloured hair she would have. Sometimes she was red, sometimes she was dark, all sorts. One night, in the agent's safe house at Bignor, Mary Madeleine spoke to Barbara about torture. I thought torture was a thing of the past. In a war, you expected people to be killed, but torture was something new and something absolutely horrible. Some of them had already been tortured. They were going out liable to be arrested and knew that they would be tortured again. It was a horrible feeling somehow. I think six weeks was considered an average life of an agent dropped. After the D-Day invasion, Catherine and her group left Paris. Jean Camrère, my cousin Vivé, uh, our radio and uh, a courier and myself left on, with all on bicycles to go to the country because this is what we had been told to do by the HQ. They headed for the Loire Valley and this small town. 
Every day at noon, they checked their secret letterbox in a village church nearby. We were expecting two um, people coming from England who had been dispatched, and one of them was supposed to replace Jean Camrère, who had been under great strain since many months. But we never saw them. It was decided that Catherine should be picked up by an RAF Lysander and brought to safety. When it came to the night that the plane was really coming down, my the noise was so frightening that I did not know what to do. It was dreadful. But I knew it was to pick me up, so I was pleased. It was the first time ever that I had been in a plane. So I was, of course, uh, impressed and happy. But then people said to, that there was a lot of flax around the plane, so I thought we are not there yet. Catherine did arrive safely. She married a fellow resistance fighter and now helps to run the family art gallery in Mayfair. It's the first time since 50 years that I speak of all those days because I've lost so many friends. I remained part of the private collection until I would say towards the end of 1944, but my connection with the French as such really came to an end earlier than that. Uh, partly because General de Gaulle's headquarters had moved to Algiers, partly because I think I was superfluous to requirements. It wasn't because, as sometimes uh, people have said to me, I had a difference of opinion with Colonel Passy. I don't think for a moment he'd have given a jot for my feelings. Uh, but politically, we were poles apart. He, extreme right wing, I very much left-wing. Uh, I haven't changed, I must add, just for the record. For many years after the war, Diana continued to gather secret information behind the Iron Curtain. But that's another story. Yeah, oh. job. Meanwhile, whatever became of her Spanish husband, last heard of in Lewis Prison? 1960. Two, I believe, my last recital at the Wigmore Hall. And after, in the green room, with the usual and kindly well-wishers, including a tall, rather good-looking man, who came up to me, kissed my hand, and said in perfect English, uh, I had no idea you sang Spanish songs so beautifully, and I simpered, you know, the usual, thank you, very kind. And he said, you don't know me, do you? And I said, no, should I? And he said, yeah, well, yes, I was your husband. And with that, he walked off. Uh, that's it. I never saw or heard of him again. <laughs> <laughs>